Welcome to Tech in the Right Direction, the podcast. This week, I'll be speaking with Christy Gurnall. Christy is Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for DXC Technologies. She is responsible for leading business transformation, including defining IT strategy for new digital capabilities, streamlining current operations, and improving overall efficiencies and performance of DXC's IT environment, all with the goal of enabling DXC to provide excellence and innovation to its customers worldwide. Her career in professional IT leadership spans more than 20 years. Christy has led four major IT transformations while overseeing changes to the enterprise-wide technology, cyber and risk management, culture skills, and behaviors. Before joining CSC, she served as CIO, Chief of Staff, and Global IT Strategy Executives for PricewaterhouseCoopers. Christy serves as the Chair of Capital CIO Advisory Board and is a member of the STEM for Her Advisory Board. A strong supporter of academic STEM programs for young women, she is a recipient of the 2018 Women in Technology STEM Leadership Award, Washington Business Journal's 2020 Women Who Mean Business Award, a 2020 Capital CIO of the Year, Orbi Award winner, and a 2021 National CIO of the Year Orbi Award winner. Christy earned her BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Pittsburgh and holds an MBA from Cornell University's Johnson Graduate School of Management. Welcome to the show, Christy. I'm so excited to have you on. Jennifer, thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Great. Well, let's get started. So Christy, as a woman in tech, can you share with us your career journey and how you got to where you are today? Jennifer, it's always such an interesting question because I, you know, in talking to young women today, they, they're kind of expecting you to say, first I did this, and then I did this, and then mm -hmm. I did this because I had this goal to get here. Um, but that's not really how it worked out for me. So as an example, CIOs didn't really even exist when I first started out. So my career journey is really one of choices and walking through doors um, and really leveraging mentors and taking advantage of opportunities that were put in front of me. So, you know, starting out as um, a young girl who was good at math and science and encouraged to go in engineering, I did. I had no idea what that meant. Um, and then I landed a job at General Motors, which was kind of a coveted engineering position where I did manufacturing engineering and learned so much about process and how to um, really solve real problems and reverse engineer things, um, which really led me then to go back to business school and then landed me at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, which really opened my mind to different industries, different ways of solving problems and um, really relationship building um, and showed me a different leadership style that I could have by putting myself in my client's shoes. And then I just kept, you know, asking mentors like about what could the next step be? What do I need to work on to grow my leadership style to, you know, continue down this journey and always having that um, knack for um, learning where I would always read. There was always a certain company I would follow to see, you know, what they were doing next or an industry I would follow. Um, and then just took the opportunities in front of me and said, I can do this. That is so amazing. I think uh, the progression of your career journey is fabulous because not only did you learn so much along the way, you just grew in leadership skills and problem solving skills. I'm sure critical thinking, lots of different areas that really kind of helps you now in your career. Definitely. And exposure to new technologies as well, right? I don't want to underplay that. Being a woman in tech, uh, technology was a big piece of that. But just always thinking about, you know, what's next and what is that art of the possible. That's great. That's great. So I understand you have experience leading business transformation for a global IT service pr services provider with more than 130,000 employees in 70 countries around the world. Wow. Tell us more about this. 
Yeah, it's it's really so exciting and such a great opportunity. And, you know, you typically don't knock on Christie's door if you want somebody who's just going to keep things running, because I am and always have really been a change agent, somebody who always asks why and then says, but what if or how about this and thinking about that next thing. So coming to DXC, we have a CIO or CEO, um, Mike Salvino, who is got this great vision for what DXC can be. And we're on this overall transformation journey. And obviously, you know, every company is a tech company these days, and we need technology to help us get there. So they asked me to come in, having led, you know, five other transformations before this to say, can you come in and help us do this? And so what that looks like is how do we create the best employee experience we can for those 130,000 employees in 70 countries around the world to then allow them to really focus on our customers so we can deliver excellence for our customers and colleagues. That's what DXE stands for. Um, so then we can take that and really start to build and grow this company that not just delivers uh, critical IT infrastructure and services to many of the Fortune 500 companies around the world, but we can be a showcase for it as well and show them that we do this for ourselves, we can do it for you too. That is amazing. Great, great job. And I love that you're focused on your customers. You've said that a couple of times, and I think that is so critical in business today. If you think about your customers, you will always grow and thrive. If you are thinking about the bottom line or you're thinking about profitability only, it's not going to be, it's a recipe for disaster, really. So customers first is a great, great priority and value that you guys are using. I love that. Yeah. And, and we really put that into action by ensuring that we think about, you know, our values are to um, deliver and do the right thing, to care, collaborate, and, and develop community um, where you work and live. And through that, you know, that deliver aspect of it, we have to really think about our customer, put yourself in your customer's shoes. What do mm -hmm. they need? What do they need to hear? What do they need you to do? What, what can you help them with? Um, not just in solving problems, but in developing opportunities for them as well. And that's what's so exciting about being in a technology role in a technology company is that, you know, really the, the options are endless of where we can take this. The art of possible is truly there. That's great. That is so awesome. So, you know, we always talk about confidence for women in technology, and you have stood up for yourself in a boardroom as a woman and as a female CIO, which is really a rarity. Tell us how you did this. You know, I think it's interesting, Jennifer, when you think about being that female CIO, and I'm going to give you an example of the last company I was at. I was when I first started, the only um, woman on the leadership team. And I looked around, I sat in there the very first day, and um, you could definitely see which one did not fit in. I am shorter in stature, I'm only 5'2", and I was surrounded by a table of men that were quite tall, many of them athletes, um, many older than I am. Um, by at least 10 to 15 years, some 20, and really taking it to a different level. So when I got in there, I really had to think about, you know, even if I stand up, I'm probably as tall as the guy standing next to me or sitting next to me. And so I really need to make sure that I can come across with enough confidence in what I do and enough value in what I say that makes them turn and say, we need to listen. And that's not, so that meant that I couldn't just, you know, sit there and say, oh, I agree, that's a good idea, right? I wanted to make sure that the first things I said were of true value to what we were doing. And that's by asking a question, um, you know, of, well, why do we do it that way? I have a different perspective, let me share it with you. Or giving the opportunity of what if we did a different way? What would that mean for us? And so I always think about what I'm going to say to make sure that it adds value so that not only am I sitting in the room with a seat at the table, but then I am included in the conversation because what I say really means something. 
I love that. I think, you know, being an expert in your field is very important to get more confidence and always thinking about how to be impactful, how to create value is so critical. And asking questions that are thought-provoking and really intelligent questions really gives you that credibility right off the bat. So I think you did all the right things. Amazing. I love it. Yeah. Thank I you, Jennifer. And, and I think one of the other things, and this is something that I always give as an example, Jennifer, of what it means to truly be an ally. When you sit in a room like that, it can often be, and especially for, um, you know, my experience where I had a group of men who had never had a female sitting there before and really didn't think of IT as somebody who should even be at the table, but I demanded it in my um, acceptance of my job offer. And so when I did that, um, you know, I, I think they looked at me like, hmm, and sometimes they will say things like, well, I think what Christy was trying to say. And so my reply to that is, did I not come across? Well, would you like me to say it again in a different way so that you can understand? Because instead of saying that, which makes it seem like what I said had no value, instead, if you really wanted to support what I had to say, then you can say to support what Christie's idea or to support the, um, the great idea that Christie had rather than what I think Christie was trying to say. It's a totally different conversation starter and words matter. And so by pointing that out to somebody, as soon as they said, well, I think what Christie was trying to say, by correcting them and saying, did I not come across okay? Would you like me to say it again in a different way so you can understand? You know, mm -hmm. like it's, it's that sort of thing that um, really can make them sit up and go, okay, this is a different person at the table. And giving you the opportunity to restate it is so important rather than having somebody else use their words to describe what you were saying. So that I think is very powerful. Yeah. And nine times out of 10, they understand exactly what you were trying to say. Right. Right. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in that, in that room, did you have a couple allies that, you know, really stood up for you when you had that idea or you had that probing question or were you kind of fighting against the room? Um, I had a few allies and really? I definitely had a few neutral. And then I had a few that were um, definitely giving you a bit of a side eye to say, why is she here? Mm -hmm. um, but what I did is I leveraged to the allies very much. You know, first of all, I sat next to one to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew he was an ally from my interview process um, the first time I sat in that room. Because um, when I demanded that I be at that table, because I honestly, like they were thinking I might report to the CFO. And mm -hmm. I said, I'm not going to take it unless I report to the president. Like I mm -hmm. need to be at the table. And um, then we started talking about the fact that 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 leadership team looked very similar. Like when you scroll through the pictures on the website, they all look the same. So mm -hmm. white hair, some wrinkles, um, white skin. <laughs> And, you know, that's something I said, so, you know, you need diversity at that mm -hmm. table. And when you say that, the president said, well, why does this matter? And I said, well, number one, I can't be a strategic CIO and really help you transform your company if I don't understand where you're trying to take it. I'm not an order taker. Um, and then secondly, I said, I looked you up on social media. I said, I know you have daughters wouldn't you want your daughter to have a say too if she were in my that's situation? That's great. And so that's how I knew I had an ally at the table and I leveraged that. Mm -hmm. That's great. I can't even tell you how excited I am to hear you put all of the things that we talk about in action. You're really, you're really living it. So that's amazing. So you're an advocate for women in tech and STEM. Share with our listeners more about your passion. How did it start? Where did it, you know, where, where are you taking it? Absolutely. And it's really interesting because this evolved over my career, Jennifer. I never thought, um, you know, when I sat in my very first engineering class and I was one of 30 in my graduating class of, of 30 women, sorry, in, in a class of um, multiple hundred, you know, I never looked around and said, huh, I'm one of the only girls here. Like, I just, I was like, all right, I guess girls didn't want to come this year. Like, I, I just never even thought that way because my dad always told me that I could be anything I wanted to be. And I assumed everybody else thought the same thing. 
So as I started going through my career, when I got to my last company and I was the CIO on the leadership team sitting in that boardroom, so many women reached out to me and said, thank goodness you're here. We're so glad you're here. We're so excited to have a woman in the C-suite. This is going to be changing for, for GDIT was the company at the time. And my 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 gut reaction was like, what? what? Like, what is going on here? Like, I know I'm the only woman and I made a, a point to be uh, around the table, but what is going on? And so I chose to have 13 women go to dinner with me. I just picked random women that I had come in contact with, all levels of the organization doing all different um, things. And we had a real conversation about what it was really like to be a woman working in that environment. And I call it the 13 Women Strong Dinner, right? It's a life-changing moment for me. And what I recognized is that some of the things that they were facing were things that no person should have to face, let alone a woman should have to face. There was still sexual harassment. There was still undertones and microaggressions being had. There were still um, things that were happening that the company just excused away. And so I immediately then went back to the president Thankfully, I had that voice at the table and said, we need to do something. And he said, you do what you need to do. And so I did. And that's when I really started to taking a more active role where now we worked with Girls Who Code. I'm on the advisory board for STEM for Her. I work with our local schools and the Loudoun Education Foundation. And I I speak at all um, different high schools and um, IT clubs in high schools and middle schools to really help them see what it is like to be a woman in the IT field. I want them to know just like as they're growing up and they see the garbage man go down the street or they see the fire person who's climbing the ladder who or the police officer who is, you know, keeping our community safe. I want them to see that there's a CIO who's doing some pretty cool things and happens to be a woman, right? So the more I can put myself out there after hearing these things was, you know, women have so much to add to this field. We do not have enough tech employees in the um, workforce, but women make up 50% of our workforce. Let's make sure we bring them in and say, this is a great place to be. It's an exciting career. I can manage a family while I'm a CIO, while I'm doing these cool things, solving new problems, learning something new every day. And so um, it really started to become a passion of mine the more I did it. And the more people I talked to, the more girls I spoke with at the middle school level and at the high school level, the more I realized that they needed to hear and see from people like me. So I encourage it not just for myself, but others. And I really take pains I learned a lot from male mentors at, in my career, but I really try and be a good female mentor as well to women in their career at all stages, because I think it's important for us to hear and learn and support one another, lift each other up. I completely agree. Wow, that is so amazing. couple thoughts. First of all, you had a great dad because he told you you could be anything you want to be, and that gave you that confidence as you were growing up. Um, role models in our industry, women in tech are so important because, you know, girls and women need to see other women in like roles to see themselves in that role. So I think that's really important. And then you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, you were middle school girls and girls eight to 13 is right that sweet spot when you need to get them. Because if you wait till they're in high school or even college, it's too late. They've already picked some other career and technology is not on their list. So really great stuff that you've really touched on. So I'm really excited about this. This is really great. Um, So what would be your thoughts about the key traits or qualities of a successful senior leaders so that, you know, our listeners who are aspiring to get into senior leadership can really think about what are the things they have to build in their skill set to get there. Yeah, um, and I already touched on one, and it's always um, something that um, I uh I always do, but it's it's learning, right? You constantly have to be learning, whether that's learning about your business and what's driving it, your industry and how to grow within your industry, your customers and what they need from you. You 
always need to be in that learning mode. So curiosity and learning and asking why and what if are all things that um, I think any employee should do, but definitely leaders should do. And a big part of that, Jennifer, comes through listening. Um, you know, when I came into DXC, the first thing I did was go on what I called a listening tour. And I listened to people at all levels of the organization, front office, back office. I met with customers. I met with vendors to really hear, you know, who are we as a company and what are the problems I need to solve or where are there opportunities? And I needed to make sure that my ears were open more than my mouth so that I could really understand what was going on. And I think that's always a trait of um, a good senior leader. And then just a couple other things is that once you have that and you think about where you want to go, the more you try and have those executive level conversations, whether you're in the boardroom, whether you're talking to some senior leaders in the company or you're talking to your employees, how you tell the story, how you communicate is really important. Growing up as an engineer, math and science were my favorite subjects. English, not so much, not so good. Um, but, you know, that's something I've really had to hone over my career is how you tell the story, how you communicate is more important than actually the message within it. So, um, you know, that is that is something else. And then um, I think the last two things is that especially for a female leader. You know, I said I was raised by my dad who taught me I could do anything. He also taught me to take risks, which are not natural as much for women, and that's stereotyping, but it's pretty true overall. You have to take a risk. You have to trust your gut and say, am I going to take a risk here in order to do that? And that's something that one of my mentors taught me pretty early in my career was, Christy, like you have a good meter, trust it, like act on it. Um, which I did. And then lastly, especially with all the crises we've been seeing lately with COVID, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war and things like that going on, um, you know, we really see where compassion and leaning in to really understand the overall well-being of your employees is so important. I can sit here and lead and give us technical direction and say this is where we should go from a strategy perspective and we can solve problems, but the best way to do that is by allowing everybody to bring their whole self to work. So really leaning in with compassion and saying, how are you doing today? Is there something I can do for you? Um, you know, making sure that everybody's mental well-being and physical well-being, especially when we're working in a virtual world, um, that compassion shines through. Wow. Such great traits and key qualities. So learning listening. And when you said listening, you know, I, I'd like to just add one piece is listen with an open mind, no judgment, listen with an open mind, because then you learn, because there's a lot of times people listen, but they already have their, their thoughts in their mind telling them what's good and what's not. And then learn storytelling. Yes, storytelling is very, very important. Take risks, trust your gut. I love that. And compassion and empathy. That is so important. I think if, if anything, the pandemic has taught us um, how to be more compassionate and empathize with our coworkers, with our, um, with our employees. I learned a lot of empathy during those two years. And I think it's so important because being authentic and bringing your, your whole self, physical and mental, in a good place to work is so important for productivity, for success. So that's great, great, great job. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And I love the way that you, you know, summarize that you do need to, to um, listen uh, with an open mind. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely what, what we need to do. So I might, I might steal that from you in the next Oh, time. yes, please do. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just think it's, I think you meant it, you know, you yes, were saying I did, it. I did. And I was just thinking, I just reiterate what you were probably thinking is it yeah. is important to have an open mind, you know, sure. because there are people who are judging everything you say as you're saying it. And I I've learned over the years, really no judgment at all. Let me look at the whole picture and then make a decision or then act on it. So that's really important. So can you share with our listeners 
how to lead in a male dominated field like IT. It's not easy. Uh, we've all been there. I've been the only woman at the table many, many times. I think you've touched on a lot of this already, but if you had to kind of put it all together and uh, give a couple ideas of the best practices to lead in a male dominated field like IT. Yeah, Jennifer, I always tend to, to lean on a couple of things when people ask me this question. So number one is that I just, I'm just Christy. Like I, it doesn't matter if I'm in a male dominated field or a female dominated field. If I'm going to lead, if I'm going to, you know, come in and do something, I'm going to bring, bring the best Christy to the table I can. Um, and then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to do it, right? I'm going to show by example that I know what I'm doing, that I I can get things done, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna make it happen. And so, you know, really that that's that's how I think about how I lead, no matter which field I'm in, no matter which company I'm in, um, and where I am. And then the only last thing I would add to that is that values really matter to me. And that's, you know, DXC, I am so proud of our values. Um, and it's one of the reasons I came here, because as a leader, if I have those values as my moral compass, I can use those regardless of who I'm with, because I can look at those and say, I know how to lead because I am leading with our values, which speak louder than any other actions that I, that I can take. That's so true. The values are so critical and, you know, it, it drives your decision-making, it drives your hiring, your firing, everything in an organization. So I'm glad you said that because values are so Im important. Um, I love that you said, just be Christy and bring your whole self and bring your best self to the table. So I love that and just be authentic and do it. Do the work, prepare, but then do the work. And I love that. Those are great, great ideas. Um, so this, this next question, I'm really not good at. So I'm looking for some help. And I don't know if you're good at it or not. But what are your thoughts on achieving work-life balance? Is there such a thing? I do not think there's such a thing, uh, <laughs> Jennifer, at all, right? And, um, you know, this is something I often talk about with women as they get typically into the middle stages um, of their career, because there's so many life choices we have to make. And I had to go through all these choices as well. You know, I went back to business school. Um, and when I came out, I got married literally within months of coming out of business school, started on the fast track to you know, think I was going to be a partner one day at PwC when I was there. Um, but then my husband and I are like, well, you're not getting any younger and we want to have a family. And how do you stay on this fast track if you're never home? And how do you do these things? So it comes down to choices. Like, what do I want now? And what am I going to go after? Now, my goals didn't change. I always wanted to be this you know, leader who could add value and make big change in a company, but it comes with choices along the way, just like I make career choices. Should I take that new job at DXE or should I not? What does that mean? And it changes, it ebbed and flowed with where I was with my family. It ebbs and flows with where I am in my career. Some days I'm a really good employee and not such a good mom. Some days I'm a really good mom and not such a good employee. Some days I am able to balance both if that's really a thing. Um, but, you know, that's what I mean by bringing our whole self to work. You know, it takes all of that to come together. And as long as you are doing the best you can and giving your all when you're in that role, right? So when I'm home, my phone goes aside, my computer goes aside, and the kids and I, like, we would do homework, we would make dinner, we, you know, played games at the dinner table, you know, asking each other silly questions about your day and things like that. And then after my kids went to bed, I'd get my laptop back out and finish my work if I needed to. So it's really, to me, more about choices rather than um, a balance. And um, I feel like I've made some pretty good choices along the way. That's great. And it is all about choices. There is no balance. I feel the same way. I feel it's a blend. Like, you know, everything happens at different times and you can't, there is no like eight to five work day anymore. It's like 
you know, there's some personal things that happen in the eight to five. There's a lot of business things that happen after five. And you just have to kind of blend and make your choices each day as to what's important. And I think you, you, you summed it up really, really well. Jennifer, so if I can just add one more mm -hmm. thing to that, you know, sure. and I think about this because work life has changed so much since the pandemic. And mm -hmm. I actually had the privilege of um, working from home, being a telecommuter at the time when my kids were really young. And I had a company that really supported me doing that. And that was by me having the hard conversations. You know, I went to my manager and said, I want to start a family, but I'm never home. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I got pregnant with my first child, I was like, I really want to do this, but I want, a, I really want to bond with my child. I want a six month maternity leave. Okay. Mm -hmm. No problem. Christy, you've, you've shown your loyalty, your dedication. You're good at what you do. We want to keep you. Mm -hmm. So there's things like that, that you can do. And the fact that I got to work from home. So, you know, I had a full-time au pair who lived with us, who would take care of my kids when I worked, but boy, I could come out for a 15 minute break. You know, while some people might choose to go get a coffee or smoke a cigarette, I would go read a book with my kids. And there is nothing better to give you more energy than reading a book and hearing those giggles with a toddler, right? I love and, that. You know, yes. just help you. And so it's, it's making those choices and doing those things and making it work for you with where you are. That's amazing. Yes, absolutely. I think, um, you have such a great foundation and such great ideas that I know you're going to help so many of our women at listeners out there to just build that foundation for themselves. So this is amazing. So now a selfish question because I, I love to travel, love, love, love to travel. And so I'm always adding to my bucket list. So where is your most favorite place that you've traveled to and why? Yeah, Jennifer, I'm with you. So we'll have to plan a trip together at some yes, point. Yes, we'll have to do it. <laughs> I, I have this wanderlust that's been built into me early on. Every Thanksgiving used to be our big family vacation where we used to travel. My my favorite place to, so I'll just say my favorite place, um, I just fell in love with Prague in the Czech Republic. Oh, You've yes. never seen old and beauty like you have there because it was very much untouched from the um, world wars. So just an absolutely amazing place to be. And you you just can't appreciate it until you've been there. With that said, um, as much as I do love to travel, I love to just also be able to get away. I like to say that I've traveled the world by conference room and hotel. Um, but, you know, we, my husband and I purposely, um, we bought a house in the mountains just so that we can get away and enjoy the outdoors and really um, disconnect from the world a little bit. And we try and get there as often as we can. So, you know, you never know what uh, favorite place you might find. Um, depends on the day. Uh, if I mm -hmm. really want to get out there and travel or if I really just need a break. <laughs> I love that. I love that you have, you know, a place that gets you away, um, that you can shut down, you can, you know, feel like you're on a vacation and you can do it anytime. You can do it any weekend or you know, a long weekend or whatever, but that's amazing. I'm going to have to work on that one, but I love <laughs> exactly. Prague as well. I, I can't tell you, I was just so, I loved it so much when I was there. Um, and to, to, the people were just amazing. And also to, to just hear from them to say, you know, even like live music in the park or in, in a club was not allowed to like the seventies, and I was like, oh, my God, you know, music makes me happy. It, it's so fulfilling. And these people didn't have that available to them. So they're just amazing, amazing things that have come out of conversations with people that live there. And, um, you know, I just love Prague as well. So great, great place. <laughs> um, great. So Christy, this has been such a pleasure. I can't even tell you. I'm, I'm so excited that we got to talk. And um, I'm sure our listeners would love to get in touch with you. So uh, share with our listeners how they can get a hold of you. 
Absolutely. Um, and I would love to hear from our listeners as well. That is something that keeps me going and motivated and um, opens my mind to, to mm -hmm. new things and new ideas. So um, on LinkedIn, you can look me up, Christy Grinnell. It's K-R-I-S-T-I-E, because a lot of people get that confused. Um, but you can also learn more at dxc.com. And we have all sorts of social channels there on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. You'll, you'll see me there as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Christy. It was an honor and such a pleasure to have you on the show. I hope to have you again on the show in the future. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been a really enjoyable conversation, and I can't wait to learn more from your listeners and um, see where we can take this for Women in Tech. Amazing. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to Tech in the Right Direction. Please take a minute to subscribe or follow so that you never miss an episode. Also, don't forget to like, share, and comment. Thank you. See you next week. From IT skill enhancements to end user adoption training, Directions Training is your resource to help optimize the effectiveness of your technology investments. Over half a million students have taken advantage of our wide selection of technology and business training solutions covering the most popular applications today, such as Microsoft 365, Azure, Windows 10, and more. As a podcast listener, we invite you to take advantage of an exclusive offer. Receive 30 days of free access to our Microsoft official curriculum on-demand courses for IT professionals or end users. Visit us at www.directionstraining.com slash podcast to claim this offer today. Hurry, this offer is only available for a limited time. Success is a journey. Ask for directions.